Nomi Ki Show. I am Nomi Ki Konst, and today I am coming to you almost from exactly the center of the country in Missouri. Missouri, outside, social distancing, not inside, even with my mask or with others who don't have masks. Uh, we are 49 days until the election. I saw a friend and an ally last night in St. Louis, Cori Bush, who is on her way to Congress. Yes, she will be the first black woman to represent the state of Missouri on Capitol Hill. Progressives are winning. And that is the upbeat news because there's the rest of the story. I am driving west right now and it is really important that we get out of our little blue bubbles if we live in blue bubbles like I do in Astoria, New York, socialist capital of the country. We need to recognize what we are up against and how much of this country lives in a completely different reality on a completely different set of alternate facts. The night before I stopped, it, I stopped in a town called Bedford, Pennsylvania for dinner. It was the only sit down restaurant at the time of that night when we were looking for a restaurant uh, and it ended up being at a very snazzy resort, a beautiful spot, really. It was, it was stunning, but they had no outdoor seating in Pennsylvania. So we stepped inside to examine and the dining room was packed, 200 people, back, stuffed together, no social distancing at all, no masks. There must have been the parents of those frat boys who are now spreading COVID everywhere because I couldn't understand who these people were um, who thought it was perfectly okay in Pennsylvania to be, oops, technical difficulty. Oh, hey guys, this is what happens. Thanks for watching and listening to The Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show for early and special content. Okay, we're back. That investment <laughs> makes a huge difference. We are not... Okay, we are back. This is what happens when you tape a show uh, on the road outside you never know what's going to happen. Uh, we thought we prepared for everything. We did not prepare for that. Anyways, as I was saying, we were in Bedford, Pennsylvania, in this uh, small restaurant at a resort, the only restaurant open, and there were 200 people in there without masks on, eating next to each other like there was no outbreak, like there was no pandemic. And then when I talked to the hostess and said, you know, is there outdoor seating? Is there any possibility we could sit outside? She looked at me like I was crazy. So we turned around and walked out and then learned about how a fraternity had to be shut down because of an outbreak. And we thought, well, this must have been their parents, also Trump supporters. Hm. But where can you hide when you are crossing the country, socially distanced in your car? Well, we ended up grabbing snacks from the gas station and no one was wearing masks in there either. Why aren't people getting it? But are those who recognize facts getting it? That's what I wanna know. Are they getting their denial? Are we getting our denial? Are we getting their denial? Do we realize how much there are folks in swing states, in red states across the country who are in denial? We too must feel what is happening out there, outside of our bubbles. I feel like we need a new edition of the Green Book. This time, instead of aid to black travelers, it will be to protect fact-based progressives against the hazards of denial, right-wing propaganda denial all across the country. We may not agree with Biden on many details of where we want to go, but he is getting one big thing right. Donald Trump is in denial. He's in denial about the climate. He's in denial about COVID. He is in denial about the meaning of this country. Fascism is in an order of magnitude worse than neoliberalism. That is a reality we also have to realize. And that is why fighting neoliberalism and Biden is more tangible than fighting fascism, which seeks to annihilate all in its way. I worry our friend Joe Rogan isn't getting this. We both supported Bernie, but now he is going on a dangerous path. Uh, he 
<laughs> called me out a couple of days ago for an appearance I had on the majority report in which I was questioning these alternative facts. I was questioning how platforms, which are corporately owned, do not have any editorial oversight and are essentially monetizing off of people who are pushing conspiracy theories. In this situation, it was a Dave Rubin conspiracy theory and Joe Rogan was talking about it. But Joe Rogan has also, sometimes he can have great guests on like Bernie Sanders, but sometimes more often than not, he has people on like Ben Shapiro who are pushing conspiracy theories and not being questioned hard enough. Or Joe Rogan himself, as in the case with his three hour long interview with Elon Musk, questioned the reality of COVID. This is the largest, most popular podcast in the world. He had one of the biggest deals with Spotify ever, a publicly traded company. So he might be a comedian, but he too has a responsibility to live in reality because the consequences are severe. Someone may have appealed to Bernie Sanders through Joe Rogan or Joe Rogan through Bernie Sanders. But my question is, if Joe Rogan is suddenly questioning, supporting, or fighting Donald Trump, where does that lead those folks? Where is Joe Rogan the gateway to? Is it to Bernie Sanders or is it to Ben Shapiro? People are dying every day because of Donald Trump's fantasy world and Donald Trump's propaganda's world, propaganda fantasy world. And more will die if reelected. If Trump, if if, if if it was a Trump judge, you know, Trump, ju Trump judges were, were supported all across this country. Well, one was confirmed with the help of five corporate Democratic senators who voted them in, who overturned Pennsylvania's rules to curb the COVID virus. We all believe in personal freedom, but those 200 people packed into that restaurant in Bedford, Pennsylvania, aren't just endangering themselves. They are endangering all of us. Climate denial is just like low COVID denial. How many people have died out West in wildfires coming up to 30 so far? And Trump says that the problem is they're not raking leaves. Seriously. It is too late to be debating whether or not this, their reality should be on TV. We should be debating how and how urgently what the best strategy is to take Donald Trump and his propaganda forces off TV and out of office. You know, I've been thinking a lot about the Green New Deal as we roll west on Interstate 44. Dwight Eisenhower built these amazing highways. They helped make us one country in a way that we were not before. Lots of people said he was crazy or reckless even. They said that the country couldn't afford these highways and they said that we didn't really need them. But Ike Eisenhower had a spine. He had seen the highways in Germany how they built them, and he knew that we could do it too, and that we needed to do it to move forward. Imagine our world today without interstate highways. Imagine our supply chain alone, how we'd be able to move all these materials across the country. A green infrastructure program is our interstate highway project, and we have to do it. We will look back and wonder why anybody was against it, hopefully, if we are able to save this world from climate change. But someone with a spine needs to push it through. And that certainly is not Donald Trump, who again, thinks the wildfires were spontaneous combustion from unraked leaves. It might be Joe Biden with that spine or Ed Markey or AOC, but we have only 50 days, 49 days until the polls close on November 3rd. If you have any doubts about the difference between a second Trump-Pence administration and a Biden-Harris government, do me a favor and just take a drive across the country and see the what I've now counted hundreds of Trump pen signs and flags on cars, handmade Trump, Trump pens posters, and the nine Biden signs I have seen on the highway. Four more years of denial are just too dangerous. And that is why the rest of the week as we're on the road, we're gonna be talking about what it's going to take for Biden and Harris to get their reality that the stakes are too high and what it is going to take for us to realize our reality, which is as uninteresting and dangerous as neoliberalism is, fascism is what has rounded up people across this country, has shot black men down, 
has sterilized women in ICE concentration camps. That's fascism. Couple of stories that are on my feed today. A whistleblower says that ICE detainees underwent forced hysterectomies. The whistleblower is a nurse employed at the Georgia Detention Center. She filed a complaint detailing, quote, jarring medical neglect and a rate of hysterectomies performed upon immigration detainees for reasons that were unclear or did not make sense to the detainees themselves. Detainees who raised concerns were forced into solitary confinement and the whistleblower herself received reprimands and a demotion when she questioned these practices. These are human rights abuses, plain and simple, and we know it. A frightening echo of the long history of the United States of research abuses of marginalized groups, including Blacks, Puerto Ricans, and women. Pfizer says it should know by the end of the month of next month if its vaccine is effective against COVID-19 and safe It must be distributed fairly and of no cost to those who can't afford to play to pay. We are only as safe as our most vulnerable. This is not just an issue for the United States, it's an issue between the entire first world and everybody else. Astronomers say that they have found a potential sign of life. Came as a surprise because Venus has long been overlooked in the search for life on the universe. Duh, aren't you, this is no surprise. Aren't women from Venus? No wonder they overlooked it. So we have a great show today. Uh, Walker Bradman is here. He has a great story that he has just pushed out. Uh, and he's been making news since he's been working with uh, David Sirota at Too Much Information, TMI. That is the newsletter that has gone out uh, after Dave, David Sirota left the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Bernie Sanders campaign. They're making a lot of news and pushing the Biden campaign and pushing uh, news out there that would not get a platform otherwise. So I'm, I'm looking forward to speaking with Walker. And then later... We have Harvey Kay and Thomas Frank, who reunite after 20 years to talk populist politics of the past and the present and what we can learn. Uh, but remember, make sure to smash that like button. Make sure to push this show out there. We are about to hit 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. And our patrons, we're about to hit our goal uh, to make sure that we are able to pay our team so that we can go out on the road and, uh, and I can actually use my camera properly <laughs> they trained me on everything they didn't train me on that obviously uh no but for real uh, join us at patreon.com slash the nomi key show it's how we're able to get great guests it's how we're able to cut things it's how dorsey is able to manage the show while i am halfway across the country uh make sure to click like and subscribe and share with with everyone on social media seriously that's you you know the jam it's how independent media works uh but next up we have walker bragman is walker here yet might have to pause till Walker gets in. But uh, next up, we're going to talk about schools protecting themselves legally in case they're sued because of their malpractice when it comes to COVID. That's up next.
show live from Missouri outside social distancing. Uh, I'm very excited to have our good friend Walker Bragman. He is the co-host of the Gilded Age podcast. He is a contributor to TMI, Too Much Information. That's uh, the, the, the great newsletter stack. I guess that's how you call it. Uh, is that right? Dave Sirota launched after the Bernie campaign. Uh, Walker just published an article uh, called Colleges and Universities Lobby for Liability Protection as they reopen. I, I lost my mind reading this. Uh, he did that with Andrew Perez, who is also a great reporter. Um, and the Gilded Age podcast he hosts with Alex Koch and Mark Colangelo, which we have been a, I have been a guest on. We, I feel like I'm running for office. We, you say that when you run for office. It's like, we are going to fight. We <laughs> live in a house together. We <laughs> We have a jacket. movement. I mean, we are a show, but like I was on your show, not not like our whole team. Walker, what's Fair up? Enough. How are you? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm good. You know, I got out of the city this weekend, so I feel I feel pretty pretty good. Uh, sorry, the the cat is is bugging this me. Is, She's uh... this is this is the new age. I'm sitting outside in Missouri, and you're with your cat on your couch. This is how we do it. Yes. What like we were made yes. for these moments. The left has been on just we're always ahead. We're really ahead on this one. <laughs> yeah, it's like um, your your lifestyle changed. Mine did not. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I did used to have a studio um and I didn't know how to use things like cameras and tripods, which I clearly failed at just now because my camera collapsed in the middle of my monologue. It was bad enough. I was looking for the duct tape because I was trying to fix something and I had like looked out on my computer. You're seeing all the behind the scenes right now, guys, because I normally have a little teleprompter thing and I did not today. Uh, you so use a teleprompter? Everyone uses a teleprompter. Okay, not everybody. Shame. Sam doesn't. I don't think TYT does. Some, some people at TYT do. So there you go. Coraline, get um, down. Get down, please. <laughs> Off. <laughs> sorry. Walker. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm just like the cat's like she's like nuzzling the computer it's like okay please just stop like stop whatever you want you'll get it just give me a it's minute okay it's like the third wall has been broken suddenly <laughs> everything's just off limits all right okay walker so let's talk about this article um first off how did you learn about this well, we go through uh, government databases. That's sort of what we do at, at TMI and uh, lobbying disclosures and, and whatnot. And there's, we were looking up like which industries are lobbying for liability protection. Um, there's a lot, <laughs> there are a lot of industries. In light uh, of COVID especially, right? Lobbying, in, light, in light of COVID, trying to reopen uh, and get protection when they do it. But what really stuck uh, stood out to us was that schools were doing it you know and, and and these these colleges and universities were pushing uh to get essentially to get a shield to put their students at risk their faculty at risk and uh that didn't that that didn't seem right so so so, so mitch daniels story. who's the um president of purdue university suggested that the school should reopen in the fall right uh 
Yes. And, and <laughs> uh, he's been and suggesting it for quite some time. Yeah. He's one of the first and, and, you know, and there are schools that are opening now, I now, I guess this week, right. Across the country. Yep. Uh, not to mention yep. public schools that we've, we've heard the stories, but uh, you've said while Daniels was publicly expressing confidence in Purdue's safety plans, the university was busy lobbying con- Congress on institutional liability during pandemic response record show. So What's the angle there? Well, I mean, I, you, you know, I mean, it's, it's the, it's the put, put out the good public face. We can do it. We can do it safely, but privately like, okay, we really have to cover our asses because if shit goes South, we have to, can I, can I swear on this? Uh, not the F word. <laughs> not the F word. Okay. That's good. So if <laughs> things go badly, uh, we, we are protected. Um, and, and I, I mean, it, it makes sense from a from a business standpoint, but in terms of like, if I were if I were a parent uh, and I had a kid who was go who was uh, enrolled at Purdue, I would not I would not be too thrilled right now. Um, I wouldn't be I I wouldn't be thrilled if my if my child's school were were reopening. So I mean, this is this is so mind boggling to me to, to me because this is also kind of what Trump, I mean, it's been now with Woodward, Trump has shown that he clearly knew about the pandemic, might have even been worried about it, we could go that far. But despite all that, the public face has been total denial. And as a result, it's bred this culture of denial that it exists, which just reveals to me, at least, that there's a clear financial motivation um, behind this that seems a little bit like disaster capitalism. And then through all these other industries like universities who maybe just don't want to lose the money because they're already strapped for cash for whatever reasons, because they don't have you know, sporting events. I don't know what, whatever, whatever their models are. Um, right. Well, that's, that's, that's the key is that they're all losing money. I right. mean, schools have lost millions of dollars uh, from, from during this pandemic. And then they're not the only, you know, enterprise that's, that's suffering. I mean, it's pretty much just a blanket. The entire economy is, is, uh, has taken a serious hit. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, no. And then, but I'm questioning, like, how are these liability protections going to, I mean, could they even, they're just worried about losing more money or, or in some case, completely protecting, protecting themselves through, through limited li- liability? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think the, the, the end game here is that, is even if they make, if they make a mistake, I mean, the liability shield let me take a step back. The liability shield that was passed in New York for uh, healthcare companies and organizations yeah. uh, related to, to patient care, that liability shield basically says, unless it is gross uh, negligence or willful misconduct, these um, nursing homes, healthcare companies, healthcare executives, everybody, they're shielded from, you can't bring a, a suit um, against them. So I think that what these, you know, if, if I were a, if I were a school trying to reopen, that would sort of be what would, what I would aim for. Like outside of a very narrow set of circumstances, we can't be sued if say you get exposed to COVID or you get really sick or have complications. Got it. Okay. Despite so that- your, your precautions. So tell me about this this nonprofit called Building America's Future. So that is uh, an, an education linked nonprofit that's been putting out ads to sort of to sort of you know get people like jazzed about about schools reopening and it's, it's yeah it's somewhat yeah school yeah it's <laughs> yeah awesome can't wait although you know like. I don't know. If I were in college right now, I it would be difficult, right? It, it, think about it. If yeah. you were in a college student right now, like in, it's it's a it's a weird time of life. And uh yeah. now it's even weirder and more difficult. You're disconnected from your friends and so like I don't know. I I feel very sort of obviously I think schools should remain closed because of COVID. Um, but I do feel bad for the students because they'll never get this time back um and no, it's, and, it's, uh, it's unfortunate this is just where we're at it, i think 
I think what's so shocking is just, um, it seems like these industries, you know, whether it's a right-leaning, leaning, you know, right-leaning college or a, you know, the they're thinking about the bottom line. The effects of COVID seem to definitely go past any potential real financial advantages that might come out of some sort of disaster capitalist model, unless you're a Betsy DeVos, for instance, who, you know, has an incentive to shut down public schools. We're talking about not colleges, public schools. Um, K through 12 to privatize them eventually, like she did, you know, in Puerto Rico with the, the charter program there, where they just shut down like 75% of the schools after the storm and, and decided to, to privatize. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it seems like the motivations are all financial. It just depends on what side of this you are at this point, like if you're going to lose more money as a result of COVID. Right. I mean, a lot of these, a lot of smaller schools are really struggling to you know, survive this. And there, and there will be, I'm sure there will be closures. I'm sure colleges will be going under. Um, it's just an unfortunate, if, if, if we don't, if we don't reopen, uh, I'm sure a lot of businesses will, because really I've, I think the, the discussion around reopening the country is really just a discussion about what government will and will not do for right. the American people. And, right. uh, I think we sort of get distracted by from that, like, oh, well, why aren't we? Re why won't you allow us to reopen? No, that's not the question you should be asking. The question is, why isn't the government doing more to keep businesses and people afloat that's during right. a time when we should all be shut down? I mean, it, this there is. We just discovered that there is maybe some treatment, a steroid treatment for COVID. They found to be a little effective, but um, or effective, but really there's no vaccine for this it's very widespread um i mean and yep. we're heading into the fall we're heading into the fall like we're heading into normal flu season so everyone's going inside i don't know yeah, yeah. I, I think i think that progressive politicians like bernie sanders have you know, who are suggesting that we have a two thousand dollar a month um basic income i think that is a good idea Especially well, now. the basic income, but also just the protection. I mean, more, and not more loans, but more protections for small businesses, not just big businesses, not just donors to Trump, not just, you know, the monopolies out there. So you, so that you, even the, the, the private institutions of so kids who are in school right now, even if eventually they have to cut, cut back, these kids can go to school in some way and there's protections and the burden's not put on the individual because, I mean, it's ridiculous reading these stories and seeing that, uh, Ivy Leagues have cut their tuitions by like a thousand dollars because of the student life. Uh, it's like, oh well, we're cutting out the student life fees because people aren't there in person. Well, it's just sixty thousand dollars a year for for a lot of these schools, and you know, are people going to be able to qualify for loans to even go to school? So they're going to have a reduction um, across the board, and and my guess, hopefully, is that government's going to be forced to step up, and and maybe we'll see a more funding go towards. Uh, public institutions and and I mean maybe that maybe free college even because Hopefully, what are we going to do look, I mean, without yeah I right I mean look these ivies a lot of these ivies have huge endowments right. um so I think they'll I think they'll be okay I think they could weather they'll be able to weather this they'll be able to do online classes and and whatnot um Hopefully. I really I think the biggest the big hopefully I mean the big danger right now the most immediate danger obviously is the virus like what happens when schools across the country reopen and we start seeing waves as we have of new covid infections like what what happens then i think the decision to reopen is basically a decision that says some people are expendable in this economy and you know we're gonna we're gonna let them we're going to let them get sick, kind of cull the herd, and then and then uh, eventually we'll have herd immunity. And that is a terrible, terrible, uh, yeah. immoral position to have. It's immoral, and it also doesn't work. I mean, they they, they tried that in Scandinavia, and, and it proved to be completely false and a horrible mistake. Um, but that's also ultimately, I mean, going back to your point about uh, the COVID liability protections, that is sort of the insurance mindset, right? Some people are just expendable. For Walker, profit, baby, <laughs> go check out Walker's article, uh, TMI. How do people find it outside of the stack? I'm, I get very confused by these things. I just get the email and I'm like, <laughs> can you explain how so, technology works to me? Well, we, 
Yeah, so we we do uh, we also partner with Jacobin Magazine, um, and we have a number of other of other partners that we can that we can co-publish with. Uh, but yeah, we put it out on Substack. Uh, it usually goes out in Jacobin as well, and um, and then maybe maybe the American Prospect or maybe the Guardian, depending. Awesome, great partners. Keep up the amazing work. Um, I mean, really Thanks interesting so article. Glad you're doing this work. All right, take care, Walker. Up next, take it's taken 20 years, 20 years in the making for the great Harvey K and the great Thomas Frank, you can decide who's greater, uh, to join the show. We're gonna talk about populism in America in, in the past, in a populous state of Missouri. I couldn't have planned this better, could I? Uh, that is up next on Nomi Keisha, but make sure to click like and subscribe and share in social media. <laughs> Thanks for watching and listening to The Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show for early and special content. That investment makes a huge difference. We are not corporate media raking in the dough. It's really you guys that are keeping us going. So please consider being a patron. And to our current patrons, thank you so much. We are incredibly grateful to you. We also now have swag. So check us out on the nomikisha.com to get your mugs, your totes, and your stickers. Key show live from the road in Missouri. Uh, I am so excited to be in a populist state talking to two great populist thinkers, writers. Uh, we have Thomas Frank coming back for his third time on the show, author of The People Know, <laughs> A Brief History of Anti-Populism. And of course, Harvey Kay, professor at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. Uh, he's an author, uh, expert on FDR and Thomas Paine, and you guys are reunited after 20 years. <laughs> That's right. Is there anything you'd like to say to each other that is not? <laughs> you look good, Thomas. You look so, good. So Harvey, I'm a, I'm a little concerned. I, I remember leaving a book of matches in your, in your house and I'm wondering if you could return it to me. <laughs> a book of matches of all things. <laughs> No, that's that's a joke. That was that's my effort at humor, Nomi. Okay, I got a better. I got a better. <laughs> hey, look at that! Oh. Look at that! There you go. There you go. So, <laughs> Nomi, I, I, was, sign. I was born in the state of Missouri. The hospital I was born in doesn't exist any longer. It's now oh, the man. site the site where the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City is. But that's where I was born. That's amazing. I did not go by Kansas City. I, I we took the went to St. Louis last night. We saw Cory Bush at her beautiful office. She's built this amazing studio there. She's, uh, you know, she's, what I love about Corey is like, even though she's the busiest person in the world right now, she still has time for her old friends. And I think that marks a great leader. Did she, take you, out to, did she take you out to the McCloskey's house? <laughs> no, but we talked about it. <laughs> the McCloskey's being <laughs> those two crazy people <laughs> who feature her at the RNC. I mean, she has security as a result. I don't know if it's because of that or just because she, you know, she's... Uh, you know, it, it's, it's dangerous. I mean, it's very dangerous when the right wing goes after you, um, as I'm sure all of us have experienced in some way and form. It can be very dangerous. You get lots of types of threats. Uh, and that's what happens when you have right wing propaganda out there. So anyways, all right, where are we going to start, guys? I, I, I have a couple questions just off the top, top of my head, driving across the country and, and seeing things like, you know, the interstate highway and realizing, oh, this is what happens when you have leaders who you may not agree with, but can actually build something great. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe people ask at the time, can we pay for it? Uh, do we need the interstate highway? But what would the world be like today? What would capitalism be like today if we didn't have the interstate highway 
And how can we hopefully, if Biden is president, um, make something as great as that or, or better, like solving climate change, uh, put, that, put that on the table? I'm going to go to Thomas first. And I think well, you guys I, are just going to talk over each other. <laughs> I've got a way of answering that that will set, that'll set Harvey up real quickly so when you drove out there you probably well let's talk you went by the uh the st louis arch which yes. is also an amazing sort of achievement i don't know if you've ever gone up in it but uh built by uh uh, uh workers who are members of something called a union oh. they, they used to have these in america it was this amazing <laughs> thing it meant that they got paid well and they had health care and all this sort of thing another thing I, I guess you stopped before you got to kansas city but in kansas city a lot of the, the uh, downtown buildings and some of the tallest skyscrapers were built by a group called the Public Works, what, PWA it was called. And uh, uh, the, the elementary school that I went to was built by the WPA. It's a, it was, Kansas City was a, was a more important city in the 1930s than it was today. But our government at the time and uh, up into the Eisenhower years when they started on the interstate system, that, that was, absolutely committed to putting unemployed people to work building infrastructure. This was a non-controversial thing at the time. And uh, we did some amazing things as a country. Now, the, the, the interstate highway system was the, the biggest public, I think probably the biggest public works uh, uh, program ever of any country on earth. But uh, I would defer to Harvey's judgment on that. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, first of all, as long as you hand it over, the Interstate highway system was first envisioned in the FDR administration, but I'm sure he doesn't mind the fact that Eisenhower that bears, bears the name, okay? The, the other thing I was gonna say, I, I don't have the kind of ties to uh, Missouri that, that Thomas has, um, but a, part of my family lives in St. Louis, and I, we, used to, we, we did before the pandemic drive down every several weeks and we would cross the Mississippi right by the arch and, um, uh, and also uh, Bush Stadium, obviously, to uh, on our way out a little bit further into the city. Not Corey Bush Stadium, Anheuser Bush Stadium. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> also not President Bush Stadium. We have to clarify which Bush. <laughs> right. Yeah. And there's a sidebar trivia that I'm. It's my understanding that the overpasses on the interstate highway system are as high as they are, so that intercontinental ballistic missiles could go under them on trucks. Okay. Yeah, the interstate highway system actually had uh, origins in the fact that originally back during, I guess it was the 30s, there, was a, there were efforts to figure out how would you move people quickly across country. And so it had a kind of military thing, but it also had to do with, with commerce, obviously. Um, it was not a conspiracy to drain the cities of people by any means. It wasn't that by any means. Um, but in fact, it was the largest, um, to my knowledge as well, the largest public works project ever pursued in, in not just American history, but possibly in the world, it may well have been surpassed since then by some massive Chinese enterprise. But, and, and last thing, sorry, I, I won't go on too long, but the last thing is back in the late nineties, Bill Crystal and David Brooks started asking about American greatness. And they pointed to the, to the interstate highway system and said, can't the Republicans, they were challenging their own party, can't the Republicans live up to that kind of uh, record? Yeah. Can I throw one more thing out there, Naomi? Of course. Yeah. What, uh, as long as we're, we're here in pandemic summer and uh, everybody's trying to find things to do in the great out of doors, go to the national park. So I went to uh, Rocky Mountain National Park uh, about a month ago, and there's this amazing road up, you know, built up above tree line up to the, some of the tall peaks. And you can drive it. And uh, there's also these amazing trails that you can hike that are wide enough so that you could like ride a motorcycle on them if you wanted, all built by a group called the Civilian Conservation Corps yeah. back in the, the, again, the great heyday of, of uh, public works in this country. Um, yeah, can I'm, I just say you're, you've hit the big three, the CCC, the WPA, and the PWA, all in a short time. I'm very proud yes. of you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor K. And, uh, <laughs> so we, I, but I, we're, I, we, I, I, one of the problems with talking to me about this stuff is I will just go down the nostalgia rabbit hole if you don't stop me. Uh, I mean, next we'll be talking about the 1890s and then who knows what, Tom no, Payne or something. This is why we are on a panel together. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy I'm in Missouri that it launched this conversation because this is an aspect I, I probably wouldn't have brought up. Um, so, I mean, 
while while we're on the topic, I mean, Harvey, you mentioned that there was this other getting people out of the cities. Can we just remind folks like what what was the agenda about getting people out of the cities at that time? Well, no, well, in fact, the, the interstate highway was not built to get people out of the cities. That actually was kind of a, a left critique as if that was meant to drain the cities. It, people left the city. There's a great mythology that the exodus from the city, the original exodus, really had to do with race. And I actually don't, don't buy that terribly. Eventually, I think it has a lot to do with that. But it actually has to do with the fact that during... During the war, there was a really a great sales pitch by, on the part of developers and others to, to portray the post-war dream that GIs had. And the GIs didn't get to see this dream. They're, they're, they're overseas fighting. But the families at home and, in quotes, the women they left behind did. So, the, so it was already sort of built into the idea that, that there was going to be growth, there was going to be expansion. And the place to go would have been out, out to the suburbs. But of course, the way in which it transpired was, was solidly built around questions, not only of race, but also of religion. There, there were neighborhoods up until the, the Supreme Court decided otherwise, which had covenants that said no Jews allowed. And I'm sure in certain places, no Catholics allowed. Can I throw something in there, Naomi? Sure. It, it's, I mean, we're, I, I don't know if we're ever going to get to talk about the present day, but in, in Kansas City, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter protests took a very interesting turn. They they uh, they they turned against a local developer, a guy called J.C. Nichols, who was extremely influential in the first half of the 20th century and built the neighborhood uh, that I grew up in. And uh, in some ways, and his you know he is his life story is parallel to the story of suburbia, in some ways responsible for single-handedly responsible for segregating Kansas City. But then yeah. there's this other weird factor about it, which is he had excellent taste, like really good taste, you know? And so you grow up in these, in these beautiful houses, in these beautiful neighborhoods, and you say, well, this is the most beautiful place in the world. And it is, but the, all the covenants that Harvey was, uh, mentioned yeah. a second ago, this guy, he's one of the ones who, I don't know if he invented them, but he made them uh, palatable nationally and was able to enforce them long after the Supreme Court said they weren't enforceable. He, he made that happen. Uh, and uh, meaning, meaning is, what what was that uh, like oh, they would have these yeah they would have these the idea was to achieve segregation without uh, uh without the state so right. they would do it they would do it by uh, by writing little uh, uh sort of codicils into the uh the uh what do they call it the uh, uh the, the deed, the deed yeah. of the property that you couldn't sell to certain groups of people and this was in some ways this was his his solution. And this man was regarded as a city father of Kansas City, a, a highly revered figure up until like three months ago. And then all of a sudden, everything changed on him. Well, I mean, he's long dead now. He died back in the 1950s, of course. But if you go to Kansas City, you'll see his um, the, the sort of jewel in the crown, which is the, the, the it's called the Country Club Plaza. These names oh that they go. Yeah, the Country Club Plaza. And right down the street, there's a church called Country Club Christian. I am not joking. And <laughs> Country <laughs> Club Christian. CCC. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I saw have... a neighborhood in St. Louis where I was, uh, Beverly Hills, uh, it was, it was basically Beverly Hills, um, like not Santa Monica, another neighborhood in, in Los Angeles. It was very strange. Like all the, the very rich neighborhoods were replicated outside of, of St. Louis. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, there's something. It's actually the other way around. Los Angeles what, copied this... us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we let, you know, Kansas that is true. The Missouri side. I just, oh, I grew up in the Kansas side, but like five blocks What's from what is called Kansas. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But fi Come five, on. five blocks from, uh, from what is called state line road, which is in fact, the boundary between Kansas and Missouri. The city is right on the state line. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously we know that suburbia, at least prior to uh, the recent wave of suburbia becoming more diverse, especially in like places like New York, where it's just the cities are so large and they keep growing and people are being displaced. But it's so obvious when you're driving and jarring in a moment like a pandemic, in a moment where the country is as divided as it is, in, in a moment where I live in a city and I've been in red cities, like, you know, whatever, swing cities, and, and you know that there are Trump people there, but 
when you're driving through Pennsylvania, when you're driving through Indiana, when you're driving through Missouri and you see 200 Trump pen signs and people with their cars, with the flags, they don't care and people aren't wearing masks and you're in an election, not to mention, you know, 49 days away from the election, it's freaking me out a little bit. It's freaking me out because I saw nine total Biden signs. I know I'm not in the city. I know that white America is really outside of the cities for the most part. I know that's by design. I know that this is this. I understand that, but it's freaking me out. Hey, no, <laughs> because- can, I, can I tell you something that'll unfreak you very slightly, or maybe it'll make it much worse? So I, I wrote an article mm, three years ago about rural Missouri uh, swinging from blue to red. And uh, blue, this is not all that this, it's all a misnomer, but uh, Missouri was. When Harry Truman was president, Missouri was one of the most democratic, reliably democratic states in America. When I was growing up, yeah, Kansas was always Republican and Missouri was always Democratic and uh, always. And their state, if you ever look up, you know, that's that saying, I'm from Missouri, you've got to show me, you know, this. If you ever look up where that comes from, it's a Democratic Party. It's like some kind of Democratic, you know, it's partisan. You know, I'm a Democrat. I'm from Missouri. You've got to show me. And now uh, Trump and it went, you know, a few years ago, Missouri was a battleground state. Well, now uh, Trump won every county except for Kansas, where Kansas City is located, where St. Lo- Louis is located and where the University of Missouri is. And much like so many other cities. And it, it's it is just absolutely tragic. And I wouldn't just I would be reluctant to just blame it on. The people, well, what the hell? I was about to say, I would be reluctant to just blame it on the people who live there and say, well, something's gone wrong with them. Because I don't think that's what it is. You know, you drive in, you're in Springfield. I haven't been there in a long time. But if you go to uh, a lot of sort of medium-sized cities and towns in Missouri, they're disaster zones. You, You know this. The buildings are like boarded up and they've been boarded up for 20 years. And these people have no opportunities uh, it's impossible to get anything going in these towns. Uh, the, if you're a farmer, you're in, in the grip of this or that monopoly. These people in another time would be, uh, uh, would be enthusiastic about liberalism. Uh, you know, and here's well, where I want to go to Harvey well, Kay. Wisconsin, like Kansas, was historically a Republican state. And I can tell you that we've had some outstanding Democratic politicians like Gaylord Nelson and Russ Feingold, but generally speaking, the Democratic Party in the state has, has always been pretty much a, a disappointment to the point where, as long as we're going to go into the past, in the 1930s, when the progressive Republicans were basically commanding the state, that's the La Follette sons during the 1930s, Bob La Follette Jr., FDR embraced them rather than the Democrats in that's the right. state. Yeah. And, and then it did seem for much of the time I came to Wisconsin in 1978, it seemed for quite a bit of the time that the state was a toss up at the state level and that, but it would vote democratic for president. And then that, that all changed. Well, not just at the moment that Scott Walker became governor, but you can pretty much link it to the time when the Democrats, after many years, you and I have both written about this, not only abandoned the FDR tradition, they also abandoned the populist tradition utterly. And, right. uh, you know, listen liberal, so, so, right? Yeah, and, so, yeah, and they won't literally. listen. They won't. <laughs> so, so here's a question, though. I mean, we, we are watching the Biden campaign. Uh, news stories have come out. I, I've been screaming about this since our first show. Uh, but news stories have been coming out about how the Biden campaign is not spending their money. Um, they're raising a billion dollars. Uh, Bernie Sanders is complaining that the Biden campaign is not doing enough to win. The stakes are high, clearly. Uh, but Jenna Malley Dillon, who I served on the Unity Reform Commission with, uh, she is the, 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 the chair, the campaign manager for the campaign. She thinks that door to door knocking is not worth it right now. It's not worth the risk when there are plenty of Democratic candidates across the country who are doing this in an effective way, socially distanced, dropping literature off. And they're saying that they're just about to start the lit drops, just about to do it. They haven't done it yet. We're 49 days from the election. So, so I think like the big question is, are they learning the lesson? I mean, in the face of fascism, number one, to speak to your point, like they still haven't listened liberal. Um, and, and number two, if Biden somehow sneaks by and wins this, 
because of the momentum of the country, because it's a wave year, because of who knows what, even though I'm seeing all these Trump signs, what kind of president is he going to be? Is he really going to be like an FDR? Is he going to be like a Johnson? I'll go okay, to Harvey because he would raise his me, hand. Well, the first, the first thing I want to say is that we made a drive across Wisconsin and had the same experience you did, Trump sign, Trump sign, Trump sign. There was a certain irony in what I'm about to tell you, but first I'll tell you what, I, what we saw. There were signs that said Medicare for all in the middle of the state, but no Biden signs. And then friends of ours called and asked, how, how do you get a Biden sign? And we don't have one. And, and basically speaking, there are no Biden signs available, it seems, in the city of Green Bay. So well, I don't can, know I, can what... I just add one more point to that? Because this is interesting. They don't have offices. They're not setting up physical oh, offices no. where people would go and get signs. I passed literally five minutes before I got to this location. I, I passed a huge Republican office. I assume it's county or city where Trump, Pence, everything was out there. And that, I mean, I remember in Iowa, Trump had a fake office. There was a facade, but nothing on the inside. <laughs> and he lost Iowa, of course. This is in 2016. Or 15. Uh, and then, and then, but this one was real. You could see in. So if they don't have offices, and if Trump is also, by the way, pulling out of the Rust Belt and moving the, his money right now to Florida, to, to Arizona, uh, to Texas, doesn't that concern you too? That he's Wait, like, oh, okay, I got Trump, Trump is doing his, that? His, his ad buys, his money moved out of Wisconsin. Uh, well, that means I mean, he's. Uh, that means why he, are we not freaking out? No, no, it's the other way crushed. around. No, he thinks he's going to lose Wisconsin. He does. So he does. He yeah, he doesn't is. have a chance there. That's what that yeah. actually is a good sign. That's a good sign, Naomi. So Are we sure? I have no idea. We're <laughs> well, living in right. post Wait a minute. World. Wait a minute. Tom, <laughs> Thomas, if we wait a week, it may change. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Everything's up in the air. No, no, that's exactly right. So my take on it would be, Naomi, that uh I think that Biden, um, it, you, you're right that he's utterly complacent and he's just it's he's exhibiting total complacency, just like Hillary before him. There there seems to be a tendency among uh, this kind of centrist liberal for, to, you know, towards uh, uh, towards com towards complete and utter complacency. And no, they haven't learned a lesson in that regard. And uh, uh, and also reaching out to Republicans as though that's, you know, sort of centrist Republicans, as though that's the that's the real swing voter in America. That's who they need to be worrying about. And I've been saying all along, no, 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 no. It's those people in rural Missouri. That's who you need to be. And they don't care. They don't want to hear that message. They're not going to hear that message. I think Biden will probably win anyways, just because on the fundamentals, you can't bungle a pandemic like this and um, and hope to get reelected. And I don't see how Trump uh, comes out. What is unemployment now? I mean, it's 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 staggering. Uh, people blame the incumbent when these things happen, and it doesn't matter what his excuses are. He's got a lot of excuses. They're more or less idiotic. I'm talking about Trump here. They're more or less idiotic. Uh, and I, but I think he's, uh, there's no way he can win this. Now, I could be wrong. Everything can change between now and Election Day. We all know that, as we learned last time around. Yeah, I I would Harvey, just say real that, quick, real quick, real okay, quick. Real quick. Guys, we're, the show's about to wrap up. Are you, are you cool with sticking around for a little bit? Yeah. I, know, five, I can stick around. Longer? I don't know about Thomas, but I can stick for a minute. I, I, what else am I okay. going to do? You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hold tight. We're going to do a thing. I'm just going to wrap up the show, and then we're, this is going to be patron release only. So for, for those of you who are not patrons, this is the time to go to patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. Uh, but that was our first show on the road in Missouri. Uh, thanks to everybody who tuned in. We are going to be back tomorrow from, uh, I think, Santa Fe, if we can get there in time. Uh, we'll be talking about New Mexico <laughs> on that trip. Uh, but tune in tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Uh, here on the Nomi Key Show. Make sure to click like and subscribe and get into that chat because Harvey K likes to jump in that chat. We know that. And so does this trucker. All right, stick around. <laughs>